Good morning, everyone. Great to have you in the house of the Lord today. If you have not done so, please silence your phones at this time if you didn't do that on the way in. As the rest are working their way into the sanctuary, we're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer and go right into our first song. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we could gather together as your people. Lord, we just pray your blessings upon this service. We invite your presence into this place. Lord, that you would be exalted and glorified in everything that is said and done. We give you the praise and the glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're able to stand with us as we sing Angels We Have Heard on High. Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you this morning. Uh, at this time, this is the second week of Advent, and so I'm going to turn it over right now to Karen and her crew and the children and some adults as well uh, to light the Advent candle today. of the one who hears the word of God has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a, a vision from the Almighty, who follows posture and those eyes are opened. I see him, but now I behold him, but not near a star will come out, out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel, and he will crush the foreheads of Moab, the spoils of all the people of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Sire, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong, and a ruler out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the cities. 
In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the high of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and many peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many people and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. No one will make them afraid. For the Lord Almighty has spoken. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. You can remain seated as we sing this next one. I go to the Lord in prayer here in just a moment, but first I want to remind you that next uh, weekend is a children's program. Next Sunday morning is a children's program, and so we're looking forward to that, and please come and support the children. I mean, I could not believe it, but um, I don't believe it, but someone told me once that some people skip church that Sunday because it's a children's Sunday, and I thought, why would anybody do that? So if that's you, I hope that's not you, and I hope that you would all come out and invite a friend and support the children on that Sunday. It's a very, very, very joyful service. They've been working very hard uh, since at least mid-October, if not before. They have a practice after worship today, so please support the children next Sunday in the children's service. And, you know, we have Saturday night service, and usually the Saturday night service is some form of variation of the sermon for Sunday, and so... Next Saturday, instead of 
uh, preparing a sermon when I'm not preaching on Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a time of worship through uh, some Christmas carols and Christmas songs. And then I'm going to, for the sermon time, answer, do some Q&A. So if you want to come out for something different, it's going to be Bible questions and answers at 5.30 p.m. And you can just show up and ask your question um, without me even having any warning, and we'll see what comes up. Um, I might say call Moody Radio or something. We'll see. But that's next Saturday. After the worship service today, immediately after the worship service, we are having our annual congregational business meeting. And that meeting is to pass the 2022 budget and 2022 nominating report. If you're a member, please stay if you can. Um, please stay if you can't as well. We need 42 and a half people here for a quorum, which we always get that, but please stay for that congregational meeting. At Bethel Friends, our congregational meetings are only about 10 to 15 minutes. They're very short, they're very simple, and they're very fun. So please stay for that if you can. The, uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer here in just a moment. And as we pray, you know, I'm going to remember to pray for various needs that I know of. You know, keep Lisa Fink in prayer as well. Uh, most of you know she's been dealing with intense back pain uh, for a few months now. Actually, I think since about VBS even, right? And Carl says she's recovering slowly but surely. And I would, you know, I just thought about this literally right before I came up. Maybe think about maybe sending her a card uh, you know, we're praying for you, we're keeping you in mind, you know, things like that to remember Lisa Fink. So keep praying for Lisa um, Fink. Sandy Mink, of course, you know, she still had those three tumors. It was determined that they are cancer. So pray for Sandy and family during this time. Adrian Wall starts his treatment for bladder cancer this week. Isla Stein came home last Monday. She's recovering uh, pretty well, actually, but keep her in prayer. She misses being here. And I hope it's okay that I'm going to share this, but, you know, I was visiting with her last Wednesday, and uh, I'm visiting with her, and Kevin's there, and Kevin told me that while Isla was in the hospital, God used her to minister to other people in the rooms down the hall. You know, Isla has visited people and sent cards and prayed for people from our church for many, many years, and here she's in the hospital, and she could not help but visit some other people. Uh, uh, Kevin was walking down the hall with, um, with Isla, and she said, uh, I got to go in and check on uh, so-and-so. So she just met her and started praying for her and supporting this other person, and praise God for that. So keep Isla in prayer. We're going to keep Wendy Coy's mother, Sally Kapler, in prayer. Uh, her potassium was critically low, but it went up, and she was able to move to a rehab center on Thursday or Friday, and Walt's been with her, and she'll even be able to go home once she gets a little bit better. Right, Wendy? He has to be able to get from the bed to the chair. So we'll keep praying for Sally. We were praying for a miracle for Sally last Saturday, and it seems like God provided a miracle um, to make her a little bit better. But we got to keep praying for uh, even more miracles for Sally to get better. And Diane's with us, and it's great to see Diane. We're keeping you in prayer as well. <laughs> Diane has her next treatment December 28th. December 28th. I don't know how I got that, but I did. So <laughs> we're keeping you in prayer too. On that note, those are the major new prayer requests. I know there's others. Um, oh, one other reminder. The caring ministry that we're starting, we're having a meeting about that two weeks from today after the service. Please stay for that if you can't. If, you're, if you signed up to be part of this caring ministry, please stay for that. And then also, if you have not, the gifts are due for the giving tree today. So on that note, let's now go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. And we come to you with an attitude of worship and an attitude of humble supplication. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious for anything. Don't be worried about anything. But in all situations, by prayer and supplication, present your request to God. And Lord God, I'm reminded that some translations say petition. In some translations, there is a supplication. But supplication carries the idea of a humble petition, of humbly coming before you, Lord, and saying, we need your help. And we all need your help. Whether we recognize it or not, we need your help. Even right now, Lord, I'm reminded that just this morning I found out about someone else, a, a son from someone of our church in the hospital. You know who he is, and we pray your healing power upon him and that you would draw him closer and back to you. Lord God, we believe in your sovereignty. Further, we believe in your providence. 
that you cause or permit, cause or allow all things. And you have us in certain situations and places for your glory and for your purposes. We know of situations where people are in motorcycle accidents, and because of that, they realize of cancer. They wouldn't have known about the cancer if it weren't for the accident which got them in the hospital. We say, praise God. We praise you in the storm. We praise you in the valleys. We praise you on the mountaintops. Lord God, I pray that uh, Bethel friends, members, entities, that myself, that we would be praising you, glorifying you, exalting you this morning. And we would be casting our, our, our crowns before you, that our worship would be vertically. It's about you. Lord, we can only come to you in prayer because of Jesus' advent, because of Jesus' coming. We can only come to you in prayer because, Jesus, you were born in Bethlehem. The first king-sized bed there laid in a feeding trough. Living amongst us for some 33 years and going to the cross. Going through Gethsemane before the cross. It's saying, not my will, but your will be done. You went to the cross for us. You had us on, so to speak, you had us on your mind on the cross. You did that for us. You took the wrath of God in our place. We're at the foot of the cross. Our sins are going from you to, from, from us to you. And three days later, rising again. And because of that, as Romans 5 is about, you, the new Adam, you, the perfect Adam, the first Adam failed. You, the perfect Adam, went to the cross for us, died in our place, and, 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 and reconciled us to God, declaring us righteous. So we can come to God in prayer. We can be a friend of God. We thank you. We worship you. Remind us of those awesome spiritual truths this morning. Because those awesome spiritual truths, we pray for one another in our need. We pray for the physical felt needs. I pray for Diane Young. Go ahead of her, of her next treatment on the 28th without, to limit side effects and help the treatment to work. Sally Kapler, we thank you. We praise you for this miracle this past week. And now we pray for the next miracle. That you will heal the scar tissue, the scar damage. Comfort her. Comfort Kevin and Wendy and Katie and Ryan. Comfort Walt and Wally and his family and Karen and her family. Isla Stein, we pray, Lord God, for her recovery. We thank you that she was able to minister and serve and pray with and support people in the hospital that she didn't even know before that. And be with her son Kevin as he travels back, I believe, today. Adrian Wall, we thank you that he was able to get the treatment. And may that start and you stop the side effects and heal him in comfort. Cheryl and I, Abby, Heidi, Katie, Brian. We pray for Katie's healing from the burns uh, two weeks ago. Sandy Mink, Lord, with these tumors, I pray that you would heal her. They're cancerous, but you knew about them before she did. We pray that you would heal Sandy. And Lisa, Lord, it's been close to six months now, if not longer. We know she's coming along. She's getting better. But I ask that you would speed up the recovery. And I pray that those that have not, through Bethel Friends, can show their support through cards, or maybe phone calls, or maybe text messages, or maybe Facebook messages, or maybe all of the above, and certainly most of all through prayer. Encourage Lisa Fink, encourage Carl, encourage your family. We pray for next week's uh, children's program. Be with the children, be with the leaders, and may the gospel be proclaimed through the children, and I know, I know they will be. We pray for today's offering. Take it and use it for your glory and your purposes. Bless the gifts and the givers. And then we pray for the congregational meeting and, and the caring ministry that started, starting and Oh, Lord God, may all this come together, everything at Bethel, friends, to fulfill the Great Commission, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, we prayed for the felt needs, the physical needs, but most of all, we need to pray for the spiritual needs. Draw people here who need to know you as Lord and Savior. Draw people here who, who, who need to rededicate their life to you. Draw people here who maybe have always been a believer in you, but, but you're not their Lord. They're not trusting you as Lord and Savior. They're not committed to you. They're not organizing their affairs around you. Draw them to Bethel, friends. May people come to know you as Lord and Savior today. Who are listening, who are watching, who are present here. And I pray that you lay it on all of our hearts. That we care so much about the gospel. That every single Sunday, every single Saturday night, we're praying for Bethel, friends. And we're praying, oh Lord, may people get saved give their life to Jesus at the Saturday night service, at the Sunday morning service, because nobody comes to know you as Lord and Savior, including us, except that someone prays for them. May we be praying about salvation. Lord, angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents, and may we do the same. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
is Jesus everything in our life? That's a question I have to ask myself on a regular basis and ask myself, is there anything that I put higher than Jesus in my relationship with him? And I pray that that answer, when we answer it is no, we do not, that Jesus is everything. And we sang this song a few weeks ago and you weren't that familiar with it, so we're gonna do it again because it is a great song talking about the Lord drawing us close to him and him never letting us go. You know, and we lay anything down that comes before him and we put him at first in our life. And if you're able to stand with us as we sing this. Let's make it our prayer. Me close to you, never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. And we're going to introduce communion, and I'm going to introduce it here for a moment. And then after that, they're going to sing the first verse of the communion hymn. Uh, if you do not have uh, one of our prepackaged communion kits, Nick has the bowl right there. Raise your hand, and he will come over to you. Right next to you, Nick, um, is Lisa and Jonathan and uh, a few others. So as you, we go to communion, Miss um, Megan, our secretary, and as pre-peeled the first part. There's, a, there's two little covers, and one's a little cellophane, 
uh, clear plastic piece right here, and then the second part is, is a thicker part. So cellophane covers the bread, and so that you know that, there's two parts, so when we take the bread, you just peel off the, the first part. The other thing I want to say about communion right now, before the first, before we sing the first verse, is we practice open communion. That means that anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ is welcome to take communion. Your status as to whether you're right to take communion or not is between you and God, uh, and we do, of course, encourage you to reflect on your relationship with Christ as we take communion. You know, as we sing the first verse of this, of this hymn here in a moment, uh, reflect. And if there's anything you need to repent of, repent of that. You know, we find our instructions for communion in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and following. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In a moment, after we sing the first verse, we'll take communion. But, you know, after that, in verse 27... Paul writes about those who have taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. The church at Corinth was very divided. I've taught through 1 and 2 Corinthians uh, three times in Sunday school classes and Bible studies. And one of my favorite books of the Bible because it's very much like the American church. They're very divided. And they were even divided about communion. So then Paul says they take it in an unworthy manner. What would an unworthy manner be? I think it'd be living in a pattern of unrepentant sin. In Revelation chapter 2, we begin the letters to the churches. And for the church at Ephesus, Jesus says, they have left their first love. They have left their first love. As we get ready to take communion, as we prepare to take communion, don't only, my encouragement, my exhortation for all of us, don't only think about those sins like lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, idolatry, whatever. Also remember the sin of a heart problem of leaving our first love for Jesus, of complacency, an I don't care attitude about the Lord. We have a lot of that in the American church, and I'm going to give a prayer of repentance in a moment. There's a sense of commission that you co commit. You're lying, cheating, stealing. There's a sense of omission that you omit. Not worshiping the Lord, not praising the Lord, not thanking the Lord. If you look at Romans chapter 1, there's this great list, this litany of sins that Paul lists for the Gentiles in Romans 1. Now, Romans 2, he comes back and, 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 and tells the Jewish people they're, they're, they have, they're not without excuse. But Romans 1, he gives this great list, but you know what he starts with? No, actually, he, he has in the middle there is they forget to give thanks to God. If you've lost your first love... Don't ignore that. Repent of it. Ask the Lord to renew it and go beyond that. Push aside your pride and talk to a Christian brother or sister or certainly talk to me or if you're part of another church and you're just watching online, talk to your pastor and pray about it. Take it seriously. We don't want to be like the church in Ephesus who have lost their first love. We don't want to be complacent. It's also a sin to not share the gospel, to not care about the gospel to care all about all these other things in the world that become idols. I was talking to a brother from another church a few weeks ago, and sports came up, and I said, it can become an idol. And he said, oh, yeah, but these other things can be idols too. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Anything that's an idol, we should pray about and repent of and get them, get them to a lower status. So Jesus is most important. I'm going to... Do a prayer right now and a prayer of repentance. I'll give it a moment of silence and I'll invite the praise team to come up and sing this first, uh, first verse and then we'll take communion. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for communion and there's value in remembering your 
blood spilt for us on the cross, your body broken for us on the cross. I'm reminded, Lord, that my words really only matter if they're an instrument of you. As you told Moses, who made, who made the mouth and the tongue? Who gives man the ability to talk? And so, Lord, that reminds me that what I really want to see happen is that everyone here has a renewed joy in their salvation. And we all, including myself, as I always pray to you, Lord, Psalm 51, 12, restore to me, restore to us the joy of your salvation. What I really want to happen is, is, is repentance of sins of omission and commission, a passion for evangelism, a repentance for losing the first love. But that can only happen by the Holy Spirit's conviction. So right now, Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit would convict. Convict to and beyond the point of repentance as I give a moment of silence. If the Lord has laid anything on your heart, to repent of, to talk to him about. I'll give you a moment right now. Lord, hear our prayers. We thank you, Lord, you are faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So grab your prepackaged communion cup and let's together peel off the top cellophane part and I'm going to give a prayer for the bread. Lord Jesus, thank you for your body broken for us. We remember that right now as we take this together. We remember how you went to the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take this together. After they took the bread, they took the wine in the first communion, and we're going to take juice, and this juice represents Jesus' blood spilt on the cross for us. Let's pray for it. Lord God, we thank you that Jesus went to the cross for us, and by his stripes, as Isaiah 53 says in the servant song, by his stripes we are healed. Our sins are taken away. They're as far as the east is from the west. We are forgiven. And more than forgiven, the wrath of God is removed. We are a friend of God. We are adopted into God's family. We are called sons and daughters of God. We are declared righteous. We can come to you because of the blood spilt for us on the cross. And Jesus, you didn't stay in the grave. You rose again. We worship you. We remember that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the juice together. After the first communion, 
uh, the Last Supper with Jesus, they sang a hymn, and we're going to sing the chorus right now. There is value in remembrance. You know, at Bethel, friends, we don't believe anything magical necessarily happens in communion as far as the, the, the juice does not turn into the blood of Christ, the, the bread does not turn into the body of Christ, but there always is the presence of Jesus with us. I was friends with a Methodist pastor when I was in Cincinnati. I'm always, I, I like to talk to pastors of different churches and denominations. And, it, you know, it's funny. We would get frustrated with things within our denomination. And, and once he said, uh, he called me and said, Steve, I'm so frustrated with my denomination. Let's start our own denomination. I'll give on baptism if you'll give on communion. And, and that's because the Methodists believe uh, they have infant baptism. And in communion, they believe Jesus is mysteriously present in the elements. And, you know, I could really go along with that. Jesus is mysteriously present as we meet in fellowship, as we worship the Lord, as we proclaim God's word. And the Bible teaches there is great value in remembering. All through the Old Testament, starting the second Sunday of January, we're going to start a sermon series on Genesis chapters 1 through 11. And I'm going to show how Genesis chapters 1 through 11 are foundational for our faith. All throughout the Old Testament, we see um, uh, Moses, God tell Moses to teach the people, and then later the prophets and so on, to remember, remember what the Lord did. And we take communion, we are remembering our salvation. Our salvation, of course, started way back in the Garden of Eden, way back in Genesis 3.15, and then, um, bless you, bless you again, um, Way back in Genesis 3.15, we see the first prophecy, and then we go to Luke chapter 1, which we're going to talk about for a few moments now is Luke chapter 1. And we're going to talk about family for a moment, and we're going to talk about angels for a moment. And as we think about family, bless you again, how many of you have family that you love and support and love being around, Right? I mean, aren't our family just our joy? We love seeing them. We love being with them. You know, I love studying Winston Churchill. I've referenced him before. He's very quotable, and I like, I like the things he says. And we do have to be careful because sometimes um, things go around that someone said something, and we don't know if they really did. But I don't know if Winston Churchill really said the following or not. But supposedly, he was talking to one of his colleagues and, and maybe one of his generals during the war or, or whatever, and his, his, his colleague, his friend said, Winston, I never told you about my, grandcho my grandchildren. And Winston responded, yes, thank you. <laughs> and, and I don't know, he had a funny sense of humor, but, you know, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, friends, family, siblings, parents, grandparents, they're all so important to us. They always have been. The family is God's first institution, really. And if we look at Christmas, it started with a family, really a few families, at least our Christmas narrative, our, our Christmas, our typical Christmas stories. And, you know, as we look at this, we see that it goes from John the baptizer being born, which we're going to talk about in a minute, to Jesus. John the baptizer was the forerunner, the one who paved the way for Jesus. And Jesus is the point of Christmas. Jesus is the point of the New Testament. Jesus is the point of Luke's gospel. I was listening to someone today uh, preach, R.C. Sproul, on Luke chapter 3 and the ancestry of Jesus, the genealogy of Jesus, which generally it's accepted that that's from Mary's perspective. And Luke's gospel was primarily written to Gentiles, to non-Jewish people. And because of that, it seems as though Luke chapter 3 and the genealogy of Jesus goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Matthew's genealogy goes back to Abraham. You can see that in Matthew chapter 1. 
And so Luke was saying to the Gentile audience, to the Gentile readers, to the Gentile listeners of his gospel, Jesus is not just a savior of the Jews. Jesus is the savior of the whole world. And Luke records all these stories involving women. And this preacher I was listening to this morning on my run so that I could give my permission to eat two donuts later on, uh, as I was listening to him, he said, you know, Luke has been called the ladies' home journal of the New Testament because there's all these stories involving women. And there's that genealogy in Luke chapter 3 from Mary's, from Mary's line. Jesus is the point. The focus is on Jesus. So Luke begins in Luke chapter 1 with John's father. We're going to come, come, come to that here in a minute. His father's name is Zechariah, although some translations say Zacharias. And his mother is Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Over the next month, I want to focus on the accounts of angels in Luke chapters 1 and 2. To begin the Christmas narrative, we see the angel Gabriel visit Zechariah. What does the word angel mean? Anyone? Shout it out. Messenger. I heard two or three people all at the same time say messenger. The Hebrew word is, anyone? Besides Bill. What's the Hebrew word for angel? Moloch. Moloch. And it simply means messenger. And it may refer to a human messenger such as 1 Kings 19.2. Or a divine messenger, like Genesis 28, 12. A messenger. Think of back then, in ancient times, they would win a battle, and they would send a messenger, and the messenger would run as fast as he or she could to report the news. That's how we got the word marathon. A guy named Marathon had to run a marathon to report the news of a victory in battle. Then he died. And so we created a competition called Marathon. And people who are crazy do it. It was a messenger. The basic meaning of the word is one who is sent. One who is sent. As a divine messenger, an angel is a heavenly being charged by God with some commission. A heavenly being charged by God with some commission. They were also warriors. The angels would come. They were to be feared. And they had a certain commission, a certain divine message to carry out. When you have a divine message to carry it out, you do it. And you do it properly and you communicate it in the proper way. The word Moloch is found 103 times, 103 times in the Old Testament. The Greek word for angel is, anyone? I don't expect you to know. If you do, you get a special cookie or something. I don't have a cookie. Anyways, the Greek word is angelos, angelos. And it is, occurs, it is found 175 times in the New Testament. However, of men, it is used only six times. It is mostly used, angelos, of angels, of divine beings. The word angelos is similar to Hebrew Moloch. It also means messenger who speaks and acts in the place of the one who has sent, who has sent him. God sent the angel Gabriel to announce his plans to Zechariah. This was because Zechariah and Elizabeth were older and they did not have children, yet... God was going to allow Elizabeth to conceive and John the baptizer would be born. John would prepare the way for Jesus. So my theme today is God sends Gabriel to announce his miraculous plan to Zechariah. God sends Gabriel to announce his miraculous plan to Zechariah. So if you're there in your Bibles or on your smartphone, uh, if not, go to Luke 1, and we're going to read verses 5 through 25. We're going to read and talk about these uh, 20 verses today. Next week, the children are going to give us the message, and they're going to do a fabulous job. And then in two weeks, we're going to talk about the angel visiting Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, so we're continuing with angels. But today, the very beginning is not about Mary. It's about Zechariah. Um, so let's read this. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife and the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Notice, notice that. They're advanced in years, no child, but before that it says they were righteous before God. They were walking blamelessly. Now, while he was serving, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot 
to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. He's, he's chosen by Lot. He's going in to burn incense. And the rest are praying. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So he's telling him what John the baptizer is going to do, what his mission is to be. Now let's read verses 18 through 25. And Zechariah responds to the angel. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man. And my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I love this. We'll come back to it. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Notice that little tag at the end. It's not in the later notes, so you have to listen to this part. Which will be fulfilled in their time. You did not believe my words, but they will be fulfilled. And the people, verse 21, and the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. What reproach? She would have, been, she would have had reproach in that day and age, looked upon as curse for not being able to have a child. Notice the godliness of Zachary and Elizabeth. I already mentioned it. I've already pointed it out. The passage says they were both righteous in the sight of God. They were both observing the Lord's command. Now, this does not mean they were perfect, but it does mean that they were striving to be. It means that their patterns of their life were following God in his way. They were desiring to follow God in his way. Do we desire to follow God? Do we, do we want to follow God? Do we want it to be said of us, his or her patterns were following God? I think oftentimes we in the American church, are we just kind of set certain uh, barriers, certain things. Something's going on. I heard a little whistle, but uh, it went away. Anyways, um, I think in the American church, it's the devil, and the devil is in church technology. I think in the American church, oftentimes we set certain parameters, certain road markers, and we say, as long as these things are okay, I'm happy with my spirituality. But that's not the right thing. We want it to be said of us, we're pursuing God. We are righteous before God. We're pursuing God. And that's what was said of them. Yet even when one is godly, one can still have trouble. And we're going to see that here in verse 7. You know, they were pursuing God. They were righteous before God. They were following God. But it says she was barren. She could not have a child. Now look, it says they are very old and they are childless. Not being able to bear children, as I said, was a very bad thing in that day. And it was quite a curse. Sometimes people may even think that this is the case because of some sin they had been involved in. But that was not the case for Elizabeth and Zechariah because it had already said that they were righteous before God. They were following God. They're living godly lives. They're observing the Lord's commands. We know from context that this is about the Lord's commands. Zechariah and Elizabeth will be blessed for their trouble. They will eventually still have a child, and he is to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. Jesus is Messiah Jesus. Uh, the Greek word is Christos, Christ. He is the Christ. 
And so he will be the forerunner for the Christ, the Messiah. In verses 8 through 17, we see that God answers prayer. So now as we look at the next few verses, we see that God does answer this situation. All through the Bible, we do learn that God controls the womb. We see way back in Genesis, Abraham and Sarah followed God. But they could not have a child until God's appointed time. And then Isaac, the child of promise. In 1 Samuel 1, we see Hannah. Hannah could not have a child. Hannah and Elkanah until God provided the child. God controls the womb. And it's no different right here. So now we have Zechariah, who is the priest. And he is selected to go into the temple to burn incense. By the way, this was a high honor. I have read that there were as many as 13,000 priests in the Jewish system in that day. That's a lot. 13,000 priests. And they chose by lot, and the one priest chosen went into the temple to burn incense. I mean, imagine being one of 13,000, and you're just kind of wondering, am I going to get chosen? Because it's a high privilege, but they also went in with fear and trembling, lest they do this wrongfully, and God strikes them down. God is a holy God. Hebrews 13 says he's a consuming fire, and he's no one to be trifled with, and I do fear, I do believe that many times we do trifle with him. Many times we do take our sin lightly. This was a high honor, and it was not to be taken lightly. But guess what? Of the 13,000, God had the chosen priest, Zechariah, be chosen that day by lot to go in the temple because God wanted Zechariah to be in there at that time for God to send his Moloch, his angelos, his messenger in and declare his message to him that his wife, though very elderly, was going to bear a child, and the child was going to be the forefront runner of the Messiah. It was not coincidence that Zechariah was chosen by Lot. It was God who controlled that. Verse 10 shows that a whole multitude were outside praying while he was inside performing his priestly duty. I wonder, do we pray for the worship services? That's what they're doing. There, there's a whole multitude. He's in there doing the priestly duty, and there's a whole multitude outside praying. What are they praying for? Are they praying that the duty is taken care of properly, that their sins are atoned for? I, I, believe, I believe probably. Are they praying that he doesn't mishandle anything? Because by the Old Testament law, by the Old Testament system, they, they realize God is a holy God. He's a righteous God, and they had to cleanse themselves. Look at Exodus 19. They had to cleanse themselves properly before they went to God. We don't have to do that anymore because Jesus has done it for us. They're out there praying. I wonder if they're praying for the Messiah. I wonder if they're praying... Today, Lord, may it be this year that you come. Are we praying for our worship services? I, I wonder, and I want to challenge you. We have a church growth task force, and, and, and we're talking a lot about prayer. Our spiritual life team met a few weeks ago. We talked a lot about prayer. Please pray for the worship services for Bethel Friends. Please pray. We have one Saturday night and Sunday morning. Please pray, Lord, today, Send people, not just one, many, to come to our worship service who do not know you, who do not know the Lord, and may today be the day of their salvation. Angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents, and so should we. Pray that that happens. Pray that at the worship services, we worship God in spirit, in, in spirit and truth. Pray that the worship services, people are rededicating their life to him. That people who are just believers, fans on the sidelines, but not really, not really making Jesus Lord of their life would repent of that. And pray that God, the Holy Spirit, is working in you in the worship services too. And certainly for me, as I declare God's word and for our worship team as they lead, pray for our ministries at Bethel, friends, the youth, the children, the technology, everything, the, the outreach, everything, be in prayer please. That's what we see here. They are outside praying. Don't look at that verse and just skim over it. That is powerful. They are outside praying. We could have a whole sermon just on that verse. They are outside praying as Zachariah is in there delivering the Lord's, doing the Lord's work. Now you're wondering, what about the angel? I want to talk about angels, right? Verses 11 and 12 shows the angel Gabriel shows up. I wonder what would this be like? Many times we read the stories in the Bible and we read them and we skim over them. Okay, that was then, this is now. These were real people and this really happened. 
I wonder, like, what would it be like if I'm doing my pastoral service, you know, going through here on, on Sunday morning, or Megan is getting the communion elements ready, or I'm preparing for the sermon, or, or checking the, when I come in on Sunday mornings, I, I check and pray, Lord, make the camera show up on the computer, make it work right, make this computer power. What if I'm doing those types of things, and all of a sudden I look over, there's an angel. Because that's what it says right here. The angel was on the right side of the temple. It even shows where the angel Gabriel was at. And Zechariah was fearful. What would it be like if you're doing your devotions and you're just praying in the morning and, and all of a sudden you look over and there's an angel. And the angel is giving you a message. I think the first thing we would do is we'd get fearful. <laughs> More than once, like twice in the book of Revelation, John tries to worship the angel. Because an angel, in, in the worship, and the angel says, don't worship me, worship God. But angels were amazing. They were majestic. They were fearful. So the angel has to say, do not fear. This is powerful. And then verse 13, the angel tells him that his prayer has been heard. What was his prayer? Was his prayer that he was going to have a child? That's oftentimes what I think. Usually I think his prayer, he's praying for a child. But maybe it's the prayer for the Messiah that has been heard. It's probably both. His wife is going to have a child, and his son, their son, will be the forerunner for the Messiah. So God is going to have a double prayer answered. It's pretty amazing. They're going to push a walker and a stroller at the same time because they're older. I'll let that sink in. They're older, and God's going to answer the prayer. But the prayers are answered according to his divine plan. We must realize that this all is taking place to prepare the way for the Messiah. All of these details are coming together for Christ's advent. So then in verses 16 and 17, we see John's role. John the baptizer will be, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from the time of his womb. That is powerful. How many Christians have the Holy Spirit? Anyone? All of them. Romans 8, 9, if you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. How many people in the Old Testament had the Holy Spirit? Only certain ones. The Holy Spirit was given to them for a certain time to do his divine will. That's why David prayed in Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12, do not take the Holy Spirit from me. But John right here is going to have the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. That's when Mary went to see Elizabeth. The baby leaped in her womb. Mary and Elizabeth both had unplanned pregnancies. One was to be the Messiah. One was to be the forerunner. The Bible says, John the baptizer will turn many of the Jewish people back to the Lord their God, verse 16. John the baptizer had a, had a role in calling the people to repentance. He will be the forerunner. As the forerunner, he will be in the spirit and power of Elijah. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, God talked about sending a messenger ahead of the Messiah. And then again in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, God talked about the same thing. Now Malachi was 400 years before here. Malachi was 400 years before this point. From the book of Malachi for 400 years, they call it the 400 years of silence. There was no word from, from the Lord. They had gone in the temple every year. The priests had done their priestly duty. They did not have any angelic appearances like this. And now, just an ordinary day, right? God showed up. Someday, on just an ordinary day, God's going to show up again to call his church home. Joy to the World, one of my favorite Christmas songs, was written about the second coming of Jesus. Are you praying like the people there, like John the Baptizer's father, Zechariah, for the Lord to not only save people here, but to come again? This is all happening to prepare the way for the Messiah. But notice that Zechariah had unbelief. In verse 18, Zechariah asks how this is going to happen. He's old. His wife is advanced in years. And, and R.C. Sproul says, it's like Zacharias says, you got the wrong address, Mr. Angel. <laughs> no, the angel knew the right address, right? Then look at verse 19. Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. These people were human. 
They had doubts. They had fears. And the Bible does not gloss over these issues. That, that's, that's a proof of the authenticity of the scriptures. If man was to just write this and make this up, we would skip that part, wouldn't we? I mean, Zechariah has an angel standing right next to him. He asks how, how this is going to happen. How does he ask? There's an angel right next to him. Like, I mean, I've never encountered an angel like that. Not like that. I, I've never actually known that there was an angel next to me. You would think when you have this angelic being right next to you, you, you don't want to ask questions. You just obey. But he was human. No different than you and me. Except that he followed the Lord. And the Lord chose to declare what he was going to do and bringing in the forerunner to the Messiah, accomplishing his plan of redemption during that time. God will still use us in our unbelief. It's no excuse for unbelief, but it's a reminder, God will use us in our unbelief. God has not given up on any of us, and God has big plans. God sent Gabriel to announce his plans. Prior to this, there was the 400 years of silence, as I mentioned. From the time of Malachi until this passage, there was 400 years without special revelation from God. How many of you like waiting on things? How many of you like even waiting five minutes? I mean, imagine they waited 400 years without a word from the Lord. Del Tecate, the author and speaker of the Truth Project, compares this to an Apollo 13 incident. On the evening of April 13th, when the crew was 200,000 miles away from Earth and closing in on the moon, mission controller Cy Libergott saw a low-pressure warning signal on a hydrogen tank in Odyssey. Alarm lights lit up in Odyssey and, uh, and in mission control as oxygen pressure fell and power disappeared. The crew notified mission control with, Houston... We've had a problem. For re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere, there would be a blackout period lasting a few minutes. During the silence, Mission Control petitioned. Apollo 13, this is Houston. Do you read me? Del Tecate comments, the Apollo 13 blackout lasted only a few minutes. And then they were okay unless it was a government cover-up, which I don't mean to plant ideas in your head. They were okay. It only lasted a few minutes. Imagine 400 years of silence. Then the silence was broken. At the right time, God brought forth his son, born of a woman, and fulfilled all the promises and the prophecies. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus, our Redeemer, into the world, that by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Lord God, we worship you. We celebrate the gospel. We celebrate today. Lord God, if there's anyone here who has not surrendered their life to you as Lord and Savior, maybe you are pricking their heart today. Maybe today is a day of salvation. I pray that that would be the case. And may today be the day where they firmly make the decision to be with you in order to become like you, to learn and do all that you say and arrange their affairs around you. May today be the day to confess they're a sinner in need of a Savior. Confess. Believe. Believe that you are the one and only Savior. Trust. Trust in you and commit to you. Confess. Believe. Trust. And commit. For Jesus, you are the way, the truth, in the life. No one comes to the Father except by you. And we praise you that there is a way and it's free. Thank you for answering Zachariah's prayer. We look forward to your second coming, but for now, Lord, may we live for you. May we walk with you, knowing that we are never alone, for the Holy Spirit is with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude with He is our peace. If you're able to stand with us, we want to cast all of our cares upon Him. He is our peace who has broken down every wall. He is our peace. He is our peace. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we have been able to gather together as your people. Lord, to be encouraged through your word and to know that we can lay any situation at your feet and you will give us that peace that passes understanding. Lord, I just pray for those, uh, Lord, that need to leave and Lord, those that are going to be staying for our business meeting that will be very quickly. Lord, we pray your blessings upon it. Lord, that as we do the business of Bethel Friends, Lord, that you would lead and guide. And we ask your blessings upon each and every one in this place. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Your cares on him, for he cares. 